Hi everybody, welcome back to English 112. This is for our class for Thursday, the 10th of March, where we are putting some closure to Oedipus the King. Note that next week is our spring break, so we won't be meeting. That will be on Tuesday the um, 15th and Thursday the 17th. Um, what I, I do hope that you do over the spring break is that you begin reading our next play in the series. So after Oedipus the King, we move to Shakespeare and we move to Midsummer Night's Dream. And note that there are multiple classes devoted to the Shakespearean play so that we can spend some time watching performance as well as talking about the play. And then we will add closure to our drama unit with a third play, which happens to be A Raisin in the Sun. In the interim, you should have submitted in journal number one, and I'll be getting that back to you if I haven't already. And the idea behind journal number one is that you did an informal response to our first unit in short story, that you selected three of the short stories that we read. And I respond in turn informally as if we were having a conversation on paper. And I graded informally on a checkmark system. So I'm not reading for grammar or mechanics, just for content. The paper is a bit different, and your first paper, which will be on short story, will be due after the break. So that date is the 22nd of March, paper number one, which will be due at 11.59 p.m. via my uh, email, ruez at gcc.mass.edu, because that's what works best with my grading program um, via PDF. And... In terms of the paper, you'll be doing a focused analysis on an element within short story, but I'm hopeful that perhaps the journals might give you some ideas about how to proceed with your paper. And your paper would be approximately, as I had indicated, four to five pages of a more thorough investigation of one of the elements within a short story. Keep in mind that that first paper is evaluated formally for grammar and mechanics as well as for content and it receives thus a letter grade rather than a checkmark grade but everybody has the option of revising that for a higher grade if they so wanted to so once I return that to you you can incorporate my comments and if you need further direction you can always um, reach out to me and I, I just ask that you submit in your revision along with the original graded copy so that I can compare the two and that you do so by the ending of the semester. But obviously the sooner the better for everybody involved. So if you will note at the in the notes below, I've got a website about the Greek amphitheater and there's a picture there of the Greek amphitheater, but we had previously viewed a video about the Greek amphitheaters and ultimately that influenced the type of production that um, individuals would be watching. And the version that we saw of Oedipus the King tries to duplicate to the best of its ability what we would have viewed in a 430 BC performance. Now, obviously there's some differences because they have access to lighting and to camera angles and close-ups that would not be the case if we were watching the play live in a Greek amphitheater. But nevertheless, you can see those large costumes, those large padded costumes, the platform shoes, of course, the use of masks, um, the way the chorus would be chanting all of their lines together. In some respects, they almost sounded like a soundtrack um, because there was no musical score. But in other respects, too, they acted like narrator or community members in that they were recapping the action. Of course, the audience would already know the plot ahead of time, so they didn't need to rely on the performance for understanding plot. The performance was more about just enjoying the presentation. And I thought it was quite clever the way that this particular presentation used color imagery. So you might have noticed at the beginning that Oedipus, and noticed that they used the, the British pronunciation of Oedipus, but that Oedipus had a gold mask, gold being a color associated with royalty, and the eyes are quite dark to illustrate that he is filled with darkness. Um, when we are introduced to Tiresias, he's dressed all in white. He's the prophet, the idea that white represents truth, knowledge, insight. And his eyes are even blacker and darker to illustrate that he's physically blind, Tiresias is, although he has insight. And notice the costume change by the ending of the play, where ultimately now Oedipus is all in red. The idea is that he has gouged out his eyes, so that should represent the blood on him. But Oedipus is also responsible for a blood crime, which is basically what incest is. So I think that suits him quite well. 
and he would be wearing this black veil to illustrate that he is now blind. Notice that Oedipus's children are also dressed in red because they are the products of a blood crime incest. Um, I always thought that the use of light and shadows was also quite interesting in this performance since light and dark and vision and blindness are major themes without the production. Right from the beginning, when we see the burning of the incest, incest, uh, incense, I'm sorry, um, and it, it obscures the vision of the other characters on stage, again, to reinforce that idea of vision and blindness. And I talked a little bit about Aristotle and how he had examined Oedipus the King as perhaps the finest example of tragedy because it helped to establish so many conventions that it would be about a great man above and beyond the ordinary. And Oedipus is a great man above and beyond the ordinary because he comes from royalty. He's of royal blood. He also is um, of great intelligence because he has solved the riddle of the Sphinx. Remember the riddle that no one was able to solve, that he ironically um, becomes by the ending of the play as he walks off on three legs in the evening, not because he's elderly, but because he's blind. So his third leg is the walking stick rather than the cane. And ultimately, Oedipus is a good man because he wants to do what's best for his community. And that's where some of the irony of the play is, as he says throughout, that even if he himself is responsible, he will uncover the truth because his people are suffering from plague. And his primary responsibility as a leader is to think about the welfare of his people. Contrast that with Jocasta, who does not care about the populace Ultimately, at the ending of the play, she tells Oedipus not to continue to seek to uncover the truth. The consequences of that would be to save her nuclear family, but not to save her family of community. So she puts self-interest above others, which is why she can never be considered a great person. She also was unable to solve the riddle of the Sphinx, so she doesn't have that level of intelligence. And the reason why we want a great man or, or a great person above and beyond the ordinary is because it's, this is somebody we want to admire. The idea that Aristotle talked about is that as audience members, we will feel both pity and fear for this tragic hero, as this person is known, that we will pity them because they are a good person. They don't deserve this fate. We'll also feel fear because if they can experience such a downfall, then we, who are not nearly as great as they are, can experience an even greater downfall. So Oedipus, as you can see in the notes below, also has a flaw in character, which is also another element of tragic hero, which Aristotle had discussed, that there are elements within the character's uh, personality that lead to their downfall, errors in judgment that and behavior that we should learn from so that we don't duplicate those same errors. So there are quite a few flaws in Oedipus's character. Certainly he's in denial. He's blind. He doesn't see what's right in front of him, ironically, because he's a great riddle solver, but can't solve the most obvious riddle of all. Certainly he has this level of paranoia as he confronts Creon, his brother-in-law, who basically Creon has been sent to the oracle to get information. Creon reports back that Oedipus is guilty. And Oedipus says, well, you're lying. You're trying to steal my kingdom. And, and that's a good amount of paranoia there. And Creon responds, well, I wouldn't want your kingdom. I have all of the perks and, and, and privileges of being part of the royal family, but none of the responsibilities of being leader. Again, ironic in that at the ending of the play, Creon does indeed become the new ruler. Definitely, Oedipus suffers from quick temper and anger. We know that at the crossroads, when there is a chariot um, basically blocking his way, he ends up slaying everyone. I had a student once said that that was perhaps one of the earliest literary examples of road rage. So perhaps we can, in that context, understand how somebody might lose their temper irrationality. Um, um, irrationally. But I, I think the biggest flaw in Oedipus's character, or one of the biggest flaws in his character, which is so difficult for modern day audiences to accept, is hubris or excessive pride. Again, Oedipus is proud enough to think that he could in any way be responsible for such a horrific fate as a plague. But more importantly, and this is the tricky part of the play, 
is that Oedipus is given a prophecy by the gods and Oedipus arrogantly tries to change that prophecy. Now we understand and empathize with the fact of Oedipus trying to change that prophecy because it's a horrific prophecy that he would marry his mother and kill his father. So we can empathize with that and would probably want to take the same action. But by doing so, Oedipus is defying the gods and basically placing himself above the gods. Consequently, that's the reason why Oedipus is punished. And, though we'll never know for certain, if Oedipus hadn't taken action to prevent his fate, none of it might have ever occurred. And it, it almost reminds me of some of the, the paradoxes associated with time travel. And this goes further back than Oedipus. This goes all the way back to Oedipus's parents who received this horrible prophecy that their son will ultimately kill his father and marry his mother. And their response is that they will try to arrogantly outwit the gods by preventing that. And of course, we can empathize with them about why they would want to prevent such a thing. But by taking action to prevent it, they are basically stating that they have more authority than the gods and they're consequently punished for it. And again, we can never know for certain, but the assumption is, is that if they didn't take action, would this fate have ever even occurred? And of course, we have questions of destiny and free will. Do these characters have free will? And certainly in the way that the play is presented, it seems like they do because they definitely make errors in judgment. But there are also outside forces at play, things that are beyond their control. And that's what we usually call destiny or fate. If something is fated, does that mean that an individual has no control to change it? And that would give us a lot more empathy and sympathy for those particular characters. Or is there just foreknowledge that the universe and the gods know what's going to happen in the future, but that doesn't negate individual and personal responsibility? Or is it some combination of the two? Religions have grappled with this and, and philosophies have grappled with this as well. But one of the reasons why we feel pity for Oedipus is because it's not his fault completely. There are outside forces at play. Um, sometimes we call this luck in our, our current time or fate or destiny. And that said, we can also understand and fear the fact that if Oedipus can fall like this because of some of his errors, then we need to make sure that we don't duplicate those errors because we will fall even further. Ultimately, a tragic hero accepts responsibility for his fate. So this is something that Jocasta does not do. After Jocasta comes to learn the truth, she runs off and commits suicide, which at the time would have been seen as the cowardly way of accepting the reality around her. Oedipus, however, finds Jocasta and he takes her brooches and he gouges out his eyes. This is thematically significant because vision and blindness is a major theme in the play. While Oedipus has had physical blindness, he has not had insight. And now at the ending of the play, Oedipus will be more like Tiresias, the blind prophet who has insight. So Oedipus gouges out his physical eyes that have betrayed him because he wasn't able to see the truth. But now he knows the truth itself. And of course, he punishes himself rather than escaping, which is the way it would be viewed through suicide. So that said, we know that Oedipus is exiled, which would be comparable to death during this time period. But Creon, who is a voice of reason and rationality, the brother-in-law, shows a, a certain level of empathy for Oedipus by allowing Oedipus to say goodbye, especially to his daughters, as Oedipus expresses concern that his daughters in particular are going to be uh, confronted with a very difficult life as the products of incest. Who will marry them? At least the boys will be able able to have professions and, and, and jobs of their own and support themselves, but that wouldn't necessarily be an option for the females and what would happen to them. Um, so we as audience feel, as I had indicated, pity for Oedipus. It's not all his fault if something was destiny and we can't blame him for trying to change a horror, horrible destiny. And we also feel fear because we ourselves are subject to outside forces that we cannot control. And also we've probably engaged in things like denial or paranoia, or anger, or hubris, which is excessive pride. So again, the lesson to us is not to engage in those flaws. So 
Jocasta, again, could never be seen as a tragic hero because she's more concerned with herself than the populace. And at the time, the leader or the ruler of the community, their greater family was viewed to be the citizens. So um, one of the things we'll talk about when we get some more closure in our drama unit is the idea of family in Oedipus the King. And this sense of family isn't just nuclear family for a king or a queen or any ruler. It also is the community, the greater family, which, of course, Jocasta does not accept responsibility for. What's interesting is that Oedipus the King is part of a three-play trilogy. So there are two other plays. There are three parts to this particular story. We're just reading the first Oedipus, which happens to be the first. The second play, which I believe is included in your textbook, is entitled Antigone, and it's the story of one of Oedipus's daughters as an adult, Antigone. And basically, we revisit Creon, who you remember at the ending of Oedipus the King, basically becomes the new king. And Creon, in the second play, Antigone, is a very different kind of figure. He isn't the voice of reason or rationality or generosity. He's filled with hubris and quick anger and denial. In other words, very much like Oedipus was in play one, which makes one question, how does the position of rulership change an individual's personality? And then the third play in the series is entitled Oedipus at Colonus, where we revisit Oedipus, who again wanders off in exile, and he's still with his cane, walking on three legs. The question is, have the gods forgiven him? Has he atoned for his sins? And I, I won't tell you. Uh, you'll have to read the plays in order, or at least watch the plays, in order to be able to get the answer to that particular question. And... Notice how irony is so important in this particular play, especially because the audience would know the plot ahead of time. So ultimately, we know what Oedipus doesn't know right from the very beginning. That makes it incredibly ironic. Oedipus discovers this along the play, and notice he's the last one to discover it, even though he is the great riddle solver. Now, no performances are going to have to use some interpretive um, elements. So the performance that we saw of Oedipus the King is fairly clear when Jocasta has figured out that Oedipus is her son because we've got the actor raise their hands in horror. And we see how in this production we've got these great exaggerated movements. Again, that would be necessary in order to be able to see in a Greek amphitheater. Um, and it also, I think, helps to illustrate the, it almost reminds me of silent movies where acting would be excessive in order to illustrate a particular emotion. If you ever talk to a stage actor, stage actors will tell you that it's a very different experience, even in contemporary times, acting on stage as opposed to acting on film, where you could be much more subtle. But there definitely isn't anything subtle about the performance that we saw about Oedipus the King. Again, much of that has to do with the limitations of the stage. And... We don't necessarily know exactly when Ed, when Jocasta figures out the truth based on the text. We do know that when she tells Oedipus, don't continue to dig deeper into this mystery, that the reason why is because she's figured it out. But the performance that we saw, the director made a judgment call as to when he would have that actor raise their hands and whore to illustrate that that was the exact moment when that particular person made that realization. And again, there, there's, there are two layers when you are watching drama and interpreting. Certainly the first is the text itself. Watching a performance is never a substitute for reading the text, especially because you're going to have to read the text. So you're going to have to do some very close analysis. But then the performance piece, and that's based on the director, sometimes the producer, and the actors, and that's interpretive. And each performance that you see is going to be different. So I've seen many performances of Oedipus the King, some performances, for instance, I've seen in Modern Dress, which gives it a, a very different kind of feeling. But I wanted us to see this performance because of its historical value. And um, do note that even though the play is very far removed from contemporary times, um, it's a different culture. Uh, Greece, uh, a culture of gods in the plural, and also it is um, in BC times. But that said, I think there are still contemporary and relevant issues that are connected with our current experience. And things like fate and free will, and things like uh, 
tragic flaws that lead to dissenting character, I think are very applicable to today's world. And I think it's something that all of us struggle with. How much personal responsibility and control do we have? And how much is beyond our control as an outside force? And how do we manage to balance the two and accept the two in our own lives? So, Vision and blindness would be a wonderful theme to talk about for something like a journal because eventually you'll be writing a second journal where you will briefly respond to all three of the dramas that we will be reading in the drama section. Oedipus the King, Midsummer Night's Dream, and A Raisin in the Sun. Approximately a page or so in response to each, but as long or as short as you'd like it to be. Light and Dark, also a wonderful topic to examine in a journal. And irony, a wonderful topic to examine in a journal and or paper. Because remember, the journals don't necessarily have to focus on one particular element. They're more like your thoughts and your reflections. So they don't necessarily have to have connections. But eventually, towards the ending of the semester, you will be writing a paper. And it will be very similar to the paper that you're writing on short story. Four to five pages, a critical paper. So you're not, ref um, you're not relying on outside resources. You're relying on your understanding of the play and our conversations about it and that paper will be due at the very ending of the semester so there probably wouldn't be time to rewrite that paper but the idea is that you would have learned through the writing of the first paper so that you can just incorporate those skills into the second paper that said there have been students who have negotiated and have handed in the second paper early enough so that there was an a possibility for a revision. Again, it's not guaranteed. It's something you'd have to work out with me as opposed to the first paper where it is guaranteed because I see that as sort of an instructional um, 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 exercise. And we talked a little bit about writing papers and the idea of how um, our textbook also gives some information about writing papers and also some handouts that I had about writing papers. We also talked a little bit about quotation that you'll be using the MLA or Modern Language Association system of quotation, which means that you are using parenthetical documentation that you are using quotation marks to indicate an exact quote. And then at the ending of that, in parentheses, immediately following the quote, you're indicating the page number. And you don't need to write page or PG or anything like that. And then you close your parentheses and either you continue on with your sentence or you end your sentence. And I'm hopeful that this is something that you would have reviewed in English 101. But again, it's in our textbook. It's in the handouts that I distributed. And also, it is on uh, Purdue OWL and the GCC website. Both websites I recommend highly um, in terms of reviewing writing. And of course, you can always contact me as well if you have questions about documentation. And since you're just working with one text and no outside resources, you don't necessarily need to include a works cited page. Though, if technically you would, and on the works cited play page, you would indicate the source that you were, or sources that you were citing or quoting from your, or from your paper. And those would list all of the texts, whether they be um, books, magazine articles, websites, whatever the case may happen to be, all by authors, listed in authors, uh, last name, alphabetical order. And there's a particular system that you would be following with last name and then a comma and then a first name and then a period. And there are different variations for books as opposed to magazines, as opposed to websites. Again, you're not supposed to memorize any of this. You just look this up in the MLA um, um, review of how to document, which again, you can find on the GCC library website and you can find a Purdue OWL. And of course, you can also find in our textbook as well, some of the earlier set of readings where we had talked about writing. Um, so you don't need to include a works cited page unless you're using outside resources. And again, I'd prefer that you not use outside resources, but if you have your heart set on using an outside resource, do contact me because there is the possibility of negotiation. I believe in some flexibility here. Keep in mind, too, if you have a long quote, that would be a quote that's over three lines long of text. You use something called the block quote, which means you indent the quote as a block within the paper itself. So that it's very easy to see that this is a quote. You don't need to use quotation marks because by indenting it in words, it's clear that you are quoting. 
And if you wanted to leave out something in the middle of a quote, not the beginning or the ending of a quote, you get to decide when to begin it and you get to decide when to end it. But if you wanted to leave out something in the middle, let's say a word or words that are not relevant, you would use a piece of punctuation called an ellipsis. And those are three periods in a row to indicate to the reader that something was omitted from the quote, not to change the quote's meaning, but merely because it was not necessary. And on very rare occasions, you can actually interrupt the quote and insert in your own language. Not to analyze the quote, you would do that immediately before or after the quote, but to clarify something that's unclear. Um, usually that happens to be a pronoun. A pronoun takes the place of a noun. So for instance, if you were quoting something, you might have the pronoun he. And based on the quote that you've selected, it might not be clear who the he is referencing. So in square brackets, not parentheses, in square brackets, immediately after the word that's unclear, in this instance, he, you could insert in something like young Goodman Brown and then close square brackets. So that means that the words young Goodman Brown were not part of the original quote. You added that in to clarify as to who the he is because the way that the quote is constructed, the he could either refer to Goodman Brown or it could refer to the traveler, one of, of each. So you wanted to do that. And again, if you have questions, just feel free to contact me. So I'm hopeful that over the break, you are able to do a little bit of reading for Midsummer Night's Dream. And, um, but keep in mind, we've got multiple classes devoted to that. And also that you are working on your paper. And I'll be in and out of email during break if you had any questions or concerns about your paper. So for today's attendance question, I thought I would talk about Oedipus. That will be due on Saturday, the 12th at 10 a.m. Again, if you need an extension, just let me know. What do you think Oedipus's biggest flaw is and why? What do you think Oedipus's biggest flaw is and why? I've talked a bit about some of his flaws, but ultimately I'm curious to know your particular perspective. So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Enjoy your well-deserved spring break, and we will continue on after spring break, putting closure to Oedipus the King and beginning Shakespeare. Take care. Bye-bye.